Um, welcome to this uh, Spotlight Tasting. Um, it's the first of our YouTube Spotlight Tasting. Um, what we're choosing to focus on today is our um, very much our, our two signature wines. And this is uh, our Wiston Brut non-vintage, uh, which is a, a non-vintage wine, a blend of different years. We'll be going into some detail about that. Um, but also we're going to compare and contrast it with um, our Wiston Vintage Cuvée from 2015, which has uh, only been on the market for um, a few months now. Um, there's a lot of similarities in these wines, but they are fundamentally different. Um, I, I suppose the, the main uh, difference or the philosophy that we have here at uh, Whiston Estate in differentiating the non-vintage wines, of which we make a whole range, and the vintage wines, is um, really the year that they're coming from, whether that's stated on the label or not, and indeed the, um, the source of the fruit. Because the vintage wines, and this is the, the first uh, series of wines that we made here were all vintage wines, um, these are coming directly from the Whiston Estate Vineyard, which is actually called Finden Park Vineyard. It's the, the vineyard that we planted back in 2006. And uh, so it's been 15 years or so in the ground and uh, it produces exceptional fruit. It's on a pure chalk soil, um, or at least uh, the, 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 the bedrock is pure chalk. Um, we've got uh, the, the, the soil is very, very shallow actually, and it's predominantly um, clay with a little bit of uh, sand, but also a lot of flint. There's a lot of flint there in the soil. So it's a great terroir. Um, very, very free draining, faces just south of southeast, and um, yeah, it's been producing some fantastic fruit over the, over the last few years. Um, now, <clears throat> so those are the two things really. The vintage wine will always declare what year it's come from. The fruit is always from that year, in this case 2015. Um, and, uh, and it's coming only from the Whiston Estate single vineyard. The contrast with the Brut non-vintage, you could call it the junior, this is the junior, this is the senior, um, is that we're using a blend of different years. That hasn't always been the case with the non-vintage, I'll come back to that. Um, but we're also using fruit, which is predominantly coming from, from Whiston Estate vineyard, but we're getting in from some fruit from outside the estate. Now, almost all of that fruit is coming from vineyards on the South Downs. Um, not all of it is, is on ch uh, chalk soils because, you know, we've got quite a mosaic of, of soils here around the, the Downs. It's not just um, uh, chalk. But um, this is a very, very interesting wine for me to make, the, the Brut Non Vintage, because I'm actually compiling um, a lot of different component parts in the blend. Um, so we'll start off with the, uh, with the Brut Non Vintage, and I'm going to pour myself a glass here. This is the Brut Non Vintage. Um, and the one we have at the moment is based on the actual 2014 vintage. So the, the, the first non vintage that we had was actually all 2009 fruit. Now that can be a little bit confusing, but it's very, very simple why it was all 2009 fruit in, in the, the non, first non vintage. We simply didn't have any reserve wine. Um, now, reserve wine is critical in a, in a, in a, in a true non-vintage blend because it, um, it provides um, a, a basis for which the younger fruit in the wine can, can meld and make something that's really, really interesting. And that's why people use it to try and achieve a house style or a signature style for, for a house. That is something that we are definitely trying to achieve with our uh, Brut non-vintage. Um, <clears throat> so, this wine is predominantly 2014, um, it makes up about 80% of the wines, so but by, by far and away the majority of it is from that 2014 vintage, but the reserve wine here is, is around about 20%. Now that's quite, um, uh, that's quite a decent amount of reserve wine. The challenge that we have in England, or at least that we had when we started making wine here back in 2008, is that uh, when you're a new winery, a new vineyard, you don't have any reserve wine. And because our initial harvests in 2008 and 2009 were actually quite small, we then moved on to 2010 at a decent size of vintage, we didn't have any wine to keep over, to keep back in order to build up a stock of, of reserve wine. 
So, um, th uh, consequently, the first non-vintage wine that we made was a blend of our own fruit plus some, some other fruit that came in from, the, from the, the, the South Downs, and it was all from the 2009 vintage, but we still labelled it as our Brut non-vintage. Um, the next non-vintage that we made was actually from 2013, and that, we didn't have any reserve wine either at that stage, because though we had a very good 2010, we bottled and sold all of that. 2011 was tiny, there wasn't enough wine to keep over, and so we didn't have any opportunity to build up some, some reserves then. 2012 was an absolute disaster, if any of you remember just how bad the 2012 vintage was in England. It was the coldest, darkest, and officially the wettest summer in 100 years, since the Titanic went down, actually, in, uh, in 1912. That's how bad 2012 was. So not only did we have no opportunity to keep any reserve wine, we didn't actually make any wine at all in 2012. We didn't pick any grapes whatsoever. So um, 2013 was the first big vintage that we had here at Whiston Estate. And it was the first opportunity to build, start building some reserve wines. Um, uh, th that 2013 uh, Brut Non Vintage didn't have any reserve wine, but what we kept back in tank was the basis for making this, which is a true, true non vintage wine. So the 20% of uh, reserve wine that's in here was actually a blend. What we wanted to do was put a little memory of every um, harvest that we'd had at Whiston into this reserve wine. So actually it does contain very small traces of 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. There's no 12. And, uh, and then the larger component of the reserve wine making up 20% of this is from the 2013 vintage. Um, so you're getting a lot of complexity and interest and development from those reserve wines in addition to all of the, the younger and more fruit-driven characteristics that's in the 2014, which was a very, very good, very big and very, very good harvest. The, um, the way that we keep the reserve wine is, is quite straightforward, really. We keep it in one tank. It's a 60 hectare tank, so a 6,000 litre tank. And as I said, it's now a blend of, uh, of all the previous vintages. So in the current reserve wine tank, it's a blend of 2018, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, no 12, 11, 10, 9, and 8. So there's a, a memory of every vintage that we've had in this reserve wine. And not only is that giving it a lot of uh, depth and complexity, but we're renewing a portion, typically about half of that reserve wine every single year. So if you imagine I've got 6,000 litres of this reserve wine, um, when I make the, the Brut Non Vintage, I'm taking generally around half of that out, and then I'm replacing it with the most recent and youngest vintage. So we're always replenishing that, um, uh, the, the reserve wine. So it is changing from year to year. It retains a signature style because we're removing half and, and putting in uh, a half again. Um, and it's a really, really interesting tank of wine to taste on its own. It, you may find it a little bit strange if you taste it because it's not your typical fruity blend. It's actually um, something that is uh, much more, um, we call it reductive wine flavors. It's very, very uh, marine in flavor and like struck match and things like this. Deeply complex, very, very um, uh, infused by yeast because we're treating this reserve wine in tank almost like it's uh, a wine on its lees in a bottle aging in the cellar because the wine is sitting on its dead yeast cells. This is doing a number of things. It's protecting the wine from oxidation because this wine is in tank for a very, very, very long time. And the yeast is very, very critical in doing that. So you don't need a great, a great deal of sulfur dioxide in the wine. Um, we've got low pH, which gives a natural protection, but also being on the, the yeast lees in the, the tank is keeping it very, very uh, fresh and alive. Um, the second thing that the lees are doing, because they're dead lees, is they're 
all the time they're, they're decomposing, they're breaking down, they're changing their molecular structure and they're actually nourishing the, the, the wine with flavors and different dimensions to give more complexity, more depth, more nuance, more interest in, in the wine. And this is, uh, this is a, a very, very interesting thing because the overall style of that wine is, is more on the savory side. Very, very complex fruit, but more on a savory and quite a mineral style. And I like that because that's a very nice counterbalance to then the larger proportion of the most current vintage that we're using, be that 80% or 70%, as we'll talk about some other, uh, the more recent non-vintages that haven't been released yet. You're getting a lovely balance um, and in many ways almost a contradiction within the wines because you're getting the fruit and the youth and the vigor from the, 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 the main vintage, that's the basis of it, and you're getting this complexity and these base notes and this depth that's coming from the reserve wine. So it's something that works very, very well indeed. Um, the, this the Brut Non Vintage based on 2014. Sorry if some, some of these numbers are all a little bit confusing. But um, <clears throat> this is producing a light style of wine that isn't entirely fruit driven just by the 14, but it's giving, get, it's getting those, those savory, complex, yeasty notes which are coming from, from that reserve wine. And the result is something that is very um, youthful predominantly, but it's got a sense of maturity coming from that reserve wine. It's light, it's quite lean, it's not a weighty wine, it doesn't have a great deal of, of heaviness to it. So very, very fresh, very crisp. And then because this, this house style, if you like, Brut Non Vintage is very emblematic of what we do here at Whiston with the rest of our wines, the rest of our non-vintage wines and our vintage wines, um, I want the wine to be really quite incisive and precise. So the dosage that we're using in this wine is actually really uh, on, the, on the low side. Um, we're just at seven grams per liter here. But because we've got a very, very good blend, a complex blend, um, and the wine has, has got uh, a lot of purity and, and, and precision to it, that low dosage is actually complementing the acidity of the wine very, very well to make it very, very refreshing. And uh, yeah, and produce an extremely versatile and drinkable bottle of English sparkling wine. Um, the overall blend that we're using in this wine, it stays the same more or less every year. It's quite a, a simple concept and it's one that you know, uh, I, I found in, in, in many of my favorite non-vintage champagnes many, many years ago, and that's to have equal uh, proportions of all three varieties in the blend. So here we're, about, we're a third Chardonnay, and then two thirds of the black grapes. One third Pinot Noir, one third Pinot Meunier. So all three of these varieties are in more or less equal proportions. And then, as I said, the reserve wine is making up about 20% of the blend in this. And that predominantly has been just Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, the composition of that re reserve wine changes over time. So in recent years, when we ha quite, haven't quite had enough Chardonnay to replenish the, the reserve wines, um, a little bit of Pinot Meunier has gone into that as well. So currently the reserve wine is, is almost a third, a third, a third of those th three varieties, just like the, the remainder of the, the current vintage is that. I like this balance of being more or less a third Chardonnay um, with two thirds of the black grapes. It's a very, very nice kind of biting point, if you like, between the, the two varieties or the three varieties. But if we consider white grapes and black grapes, um, of course, with the black grapes, gr uh, grapes we're pressing very, very gently, so um, we're just getting uh, clear juice. But um, those, those two pinots are adding something very different to the Chardonnay. The Chardonnay is very, very um, uh, uh, light when it's young. It can be a little bit austere when it's young. Um, so the addition of the Pinot Noir is giving a little bit of backbone and structure to the wine. But Pinot Meunier is extremely important in this blend. Because the Pinot Meunier, and we are very high in our content of, of Pinot Meunier here, 
where, you know, being a third of the overall blend is, I think, the highest amount of Pinot Meunier in, in, in any um, English uh, non-vintage sparkling wine. Um, and what the Meunier is giving is, uh, is, is fruit, pure fruit, sometimes quite, quite fat and juicy fruit. Um, Meunier is a, is a wonderful variety to grow in the UK because um, it produces these, these wonderful fruity, sometimes earthy flavors. Um, but it's got a great nose. The perfume on that wine is absolutely beautiful, especially in its youth. So you could say that the Pinot Meunier is actually allowing this wine to, to show maturity, even when it's really quite young. Um, this wine here is four years on lees now, so very much the Pinot Noir, and then latterly the Chardonnay is starting to, to take more center stage in the wine. And this ensures that the wine can age very, very gracefully. And, uh, and goes through quite, a, quite an evolution, actually. Yeah. So this is the wine that we make the biggest volume of every year. It's uh, still a relatively small volume, somewhere in the region of 30,000 bottles. And uh, it's a great pleasure to make. It really is a great pleasure to make because... Um, you know, with the vintage wines, as, as I'll describe in a, in a moment... Um, the, that wine pretty much makes itself. You know, it's coming from the best fruit of the Finland Park vineyard. And uh, I do some specific things with it, but it's not uh, requiring a great deal of, of putting together of different components. With the Brut Non Vintage, this is very often coming from, you know, a lot of dif different fruit, from different vineyards, from different soils. So there's actually quite a lot of deci de de decisions um, to make about what is going to, to, to work in the blend and then also what to keep back to, to add to the reserve wine. So I get a lot of pleasure from this wine and it's absolutely fantastic when, you know, some people say, wow, this is the favorite wine in the range um, because it's also the, the cheapest wine in our range. Retail price of this wine is £26.50. And uh, I think in terms of um, bang for your buck for English sparkling wine, I think you do... Um, you'd find it very, very difficult to find something that's delivering as much quality for, for, the, for the value of, of this wine. Yeah, so wine is very, very um, close to my heart. I like it a great deal. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that is the, uh, the Brut non-vintage. We're going to, I'm going to use the same glass. Let's put these down here. Keep that one here. And this is very much our signature um, uh, vintage wine. Now, the vintage wine is uh, designed and built to be a little bit more serious um, and gastronomic, you could say, um, than the Brut Non Vintage. Brut Non Vintage is wonderfully versatile. It's a perfect party wine. It's a it's a chat and talk wine. It's wonderful with a whole range of foods. Um, the vintage wine is a little bit more serious. And initially, or rather immediately, you can see we've got a lot of deeper color in this wine. And that, this really indicates that there's a, a, a greater depth in, 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 in this wine, depth of flavor. Um, the style, or rather the winemaking methodology here, for the, uh, for the vintage wine has grown and changed and morphed a lot over the years. Um, it started off being a Chardonnay dominant blend when we made the, the first 2008 and 2009 wines. Those are actually dominated by Chardonnay around about 60% and up to two thirds of the blend with Chardonnay. So giving a real drive and focus of, of that Chardonnay style with you know, the Pinots playing very much a, a smaller role in the background, only making up around 40% or, or one third of the wine. Now, I like this style of wine very, very much. However, after 2008 and 2009, um, I wanted to, to very much um, uh, concentrate on making our Blanc Blanc. Now, for our Blanc Blanc, which of course is 100% Chardonnay, we needed as much Chardonnay as possible. So that's why I decided to alter the direction, the course of the, uh, of the, the, the vintage cuvee. So from 2010, vintage on, I started making this a Pinot dominant wine. Um, again, just like the balance of the Brut Non Vintage, 
I very much like that um, the, the, the point of having about a third of, uh, of Chardonnay in the wine. So we're generally the same kind of principle, one third Chardonnay and two thirds of the black grapes. However, the composition of the black grapes in the, in the, the vintage blend is, is, is quite different. I'm reducing the amount of Pinot Meunier um, and increasing the amount of Pinot Noir. Now, Pinot Noir, just like Chardonnay, they've got great ability to age. Um, and they're giving more structure and, uh, and definition to the wine, um, especially when, they, when the wines start out young and then we allow them to go on a long um, journey of development, both in the winery before the wine is bottled and then importantly once the wines are bottled in the cellar to give them uh, uh, time. So the, the chief difference really, grapes are pressed in the same way, they go into a stainless steel tank, the juice immediately after, um, after being pressed in our cocker press, which you can see here behind me. Um, but once the fermentation is started inside the stainless steel tank, for the Brut Non Vintage, it'll remain in stainless steel. For the um, vintage, all of that wine is being transferred very, very soon into old oak barrels. Now, the barrels are burgundy barrels. They're generally 228 litre burgundy barrels. Um, in recent years, we've started also using some 500 litre barrels, but frankly, for the cuvee, I like to use the smaller burgundy barrels. Um, I'm buying these on a semi-frequent basis from, from burgundy. Um, uh, and I'm buying them when they're generally about three years of age, four, five, or six years of age. And this is very, very important for the style because Whilst I'm using 100% oak in this wine, um, there's no new oak. It's all old oak. So we're not looking to, we're not searching to get any actual overt oak flavors. We don't want any of that kind of coconut and vanilla and things like this in the wine. The idea is to add texture to the wine. It's to give the wine breath and amplitude and complexity on nuance that you just will not get in a stainless steel tank. I think the, the, the best way of describing the different journeys that the wines go through, um, say the Brut Non Vintage in stainless steel and the vintage in old oak barrels, is when you're in stainless steel, the wine is not interacting with, it, with its environment outside of the tank in any way. It's hermetically sealed in the tank, if you wish. There's no air transmission um, going into the, the stainless steel tank and what's in there stays in there. Now it's a very, very different situation when the wine is in a barrel because a barrel is it's, it's wood, it's porous. So there's an ability for the, for the wine to interact with its environment all the time. You know, what's happening outside the barrel is very, very much transmitted inside the barrel. You're constantly having a, a slow little leak of, uh, of air, of oxygen coming in, and this very, very slow micro-oxygenation of the wine is having quite a profound effect. So the principal effect is, is that texture that I was talking about. The wine becomes very smooth um, and, uh, and, and, and creamy and developing this, this depth. Um, the wine in the barrels, and uh, we can see here these barrels behind me is not actually um, our, our Brut Non Vintage, or sorry, it's not actually our, our cuvee, this is our Blanc Blanc from 2009 is in those, those barrels behind me there. Those are 500 litre barrels. Um, the, uh, the, the effect of the air um, is, is, is very much keeping these wines alive and on a, on a journey of élevage, as the French say, that they're growing up all the time. Just like in stainless steel, the wine in the barrels are sitting on a lees deposit, on yeast. Now this yeast isn't dead, it's very, very much alive because it's yeast that's been created from the, the first fermentation, which is happening in October and November. Um, so it's fresh, fresh yeast. It's again, it's keeping the wine alive and helping to contribute to the development and the protection of the wine, which is, you know, exposed to a little bit of air as I said. Um, these wines, we can really see the evolution of them over the six months or so that they're in the barrel. 
we typically uh, take the wine out of the barrel just before we bottle the wine. So if it goes in there in October, you're talking about, you know, seven or eight months that the wine is inside uh, these barrels. Um, another feature of, of what's going on in uh, this, this vintage wine here is very often I'll decide not to do any malolactic fermentation on the wines which are in the barrel. Because there's a, a creaminess in, uh, in, in the, the, the wine which is aged in the, in the barrel, the acidity, the natural acidity that's in the fruit gets very, very much integrated into the wine. And, uh, and that's why I don't want to make the wine any, um, any less acidic, if you like. I don't want to dampen that lovely fresh acid profile because when you combine it with the creaminess of the, of the wine, um, you need that, that, the electricity of the acidity to balance it. And of course, we're making wines for the long term here with these vintage wines, and you need good acidity, very, very fresh and lively and energetic acidity to be able to, um, to, to follow the wine throughout its development over the next decade, really. Um, one of the main differences with the uh, Brutanon vintage is I tend to, when I was talking about using, doing di different things to different compartments of the wine or different components of the wine, um, uh, one of the key things I do is managing the malolactic fermentation on, on the different parcels. So typically the Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, uh, and sorry, the Chardonnay, I'll, I'll put those ones through malolactic fermentation in order to soften them, make them more complex, make them a little bit um, more uh, accessible. But with the Pinot Meunier, I'm not actually um, uh, doing any malolactic fermentation on the Pinot Meunier at all. And that's because I want to try and keep the, the clarity of fruit that's in the, uh, the Pinot Meunier for, for the Bruton Vintage blend. It's a, it's a very, very uh, important part of the development of the wines when they're young to have that lovely um, flash of, of Meunier um, uh, fruit and those confectionery flavors that make it so so attractive when they're quite young because when you do malolactic fermentation you can actually you know alter sometimes quite dramatically the flavor profile of, of the wines in question and uh, I like to keep that one as, as straight as possible. Um, yeah, so the, this, this uh, vintage Cuvée 2015, it's very, very much in the style of our Cuvée 2013, which was, um, uh, you know, the, the, the first Cuvée that we made. No, it wasn't. It was the 2010, then the 13, which were based on, on uh, the higher amount of black grapes. But uh, this style is, um, is, has got a lot of, of, um, of depth and, and um, uh, base notes in the wine. And that's because in 2013 and 15, um, unlike 2010, I actually used some of our uh, Pinot Noir um, uh, vines, which um, are Dijon clones, so they're not actually Champagne clones. They're, um, they're actually wines for, uh, uh, clones for making red wine. Um, and putting this into, the, uh, into this wine, into the cuvee, has given it a, a great completeness and a roundness of, d of depth. Um, I'm going to actually read you a tasting note, which I think describes this wine quite brilliantly. This was um, uh, it's in this rather lyrical tasting note from uh, Tamlin Curry, uh, who writes for jansonsrobinson.com. And uh, the first thing she said, actually, which is nice to hear, is she said, Bravo to Whiston and all the other producers who do it for putting the disgorgement date and dosage on the back label. Now, this is something we've been doing for, for a long time, right from the very, very start, actually. So um, we're printing the date of disgorgement. It's going to be probably pretty difficult for you to see from here. But this wine was disgorged in November 2019. And we're also stating what the dosage is, 8 grams per litre. So it's nice to be able to have that information, both for consumers and for ourselves, so that when we're uh, actually tasting and, and, uh, and, and looking at these wines, we know when they were disgorged. So 2015, bottled in 2016, and then disgorged in, at the end of 2019. So the one we're, we're drinking here is actually just about three and a half years on lees, just under four years on lees, and uh, disgorged about five months ago. Um, so I'll go back to 
Tom and Curry's um, effusive tasting note here. Golden color. I think that's pretty evident. Deep golden color here in this wine. Fine, sparse bead, but very tight and sharp. Very toasty nose. The barrel aging has made a huge impact on this wine, nose and palate. It's rich and spicy. Deeply golden in flavor. Grilled brioche, golden peaches, satsumas and saffron. It rolls across the tongue like trumpet and drum. Silvery notes slipping through old gold, intent, piercing. A very, very sophisticated sparkling wine. Thank you, Tamlin. That's a pretty, pretty good review. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So that is um, the principal differences between these two wines. Um, the, it's a, they're diverging styles which have emerged over the, the, the last, well, we've been making wine here since 2008, so the last 12 years of winemaking at, uh, at Whiston Estate. And I'm very, very happy with the, the two different trajectories of the wine because they're designed to be different, they're designed to be individuals, yet they actually share quite a lot in common. Um, we've uh, also had a, 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 a pattern of um, doing uh, non-vintage wines with the other vintage wines. For instance, we do a non-vintage Blanc Blanc, Blanc um, and uh, a vintage Blanc Blanc, Blanc as well. And we're on the same vintage 2015 for our Blanc Blanc. Blanc. Um, and our rosé, we make two different rosés. Um, a non-vintage rosé and also a vintage rosé. We're on the 2014 rosé for that. So we can look at those um, wines in a, in a different spotlight tasting. Um, but right now, I believe we've got some questions. Um, so our first question uh, okay. is from uh, Brad Horn. Uh, okay. He's asking you, what is the toughest job for a winemaker? Well, um, Hi Brad, how are you mate? Um, uh, what is the toughest job for a winemaker? Well, look, there's, um, there's exciting parts of the year, which are always, always a, a real pleasure, such as bottling and harvest. But then there's also very, very stressful times of the year. Um, and, and therefore, was, the question was the toughest, toughest part of being a winemaker? Um, I think it must be um, making decisions and being absolutely... Uh, or being as confident as you possibly can about the decisions that you make. You've got to make decisions when you're a winemaker. There's, there's no question about that. Um, harvesting, that's a, that's a, a big deal. Um, when you're going to harvest, it's, it's not always simply a question of, uh, of, of uh, you know, how long you're going to leave the grapes out there. Um, in terms of the weather, it's a question of lots of other uh, things to do with availability of people to pick it, um, uh, you know, what, what the, the level of ripeness is and what you'd like it to be. So uh, that's always a, a difficult decision, but uh, exciting because, you know, I like to take uh, uh, little risks here at Whiston Estate with the winemaking. And one of the things I've always done is try to leave the grapes out there for as long as possible. We don't have to worry about over ripeness in the, in the UK for sparkling wine. It's not an issue. We just need to try and give the grapes as much time to achieve physiological ripeness as we possibly can. Now, very often that can be quite a, um, a nail-biting experience. But, um, yeah, you've just got to trust your instincts and, and trust the weather forecast as much as you can. And then be prepared to act very, very quickly. Um, particularly with our Chardonnay, because, you know, Pinot Meunier will ripen generally first. Pinot Noir will come after that. But... Uh, then uh, it's Chardonnay and you've got to hold your nerve with Chardonnay um, because it's got you know a lot of high acidity and you want that to, to, to melt um, as much as possible and leaving it out there for as long as possible is, is crucial. So it's a nervous time because very often we're very busy in the, in the winery, um, you know, making some other wines and uh, yeah, you've got to keep your eye on that. So that's, that's probably the, the toughest deal. Following on from that, Bottling is, is generally a pretty hair-raising experience because, you know, we tend to bottle a, a lot of wines in a very short period of time and, yeah, you, you've got to have all your ducks in a row. That can be a little bit stressful, but, you know, it's a wonderful feeling when you, when you get it all, all done. <laughs>
So another interesting question is um, the previous release to the 2015 was 2009. Yeah. Which obviously is a slightly mm, odd yes. decision for most people. Yeah. Um, can you explain why we did that and um, and what's why there's such a difference? How will it have affected the wine doing 15 now and? Okay, so the, the order that we released the wines, the vintages, the cuvee vintages, was 2008. Then we kept the 2009 in the cellar and then released 2010. Then we released 2013. And then we went back and released the 2009. There's a couple of things which, which were, were at play here. First of all, 2009 as a vintage was a very, very uh, good vintage, but you know, there were wines definitely built for long, long aging because we had very, very high levels of sugar maturity in the wines, but also correspondingly high levels of acidity in the, in the wines. Now, when I made that wine in, in 2009, it was like the 2008, I had a very, very high Chardonnay component in the wines. Um, I put some of it into a stainless steel tank and I put some of it into barrel. Now, as the wines were developing in the tank and the barrel, I loved the taste pro profile of, of both of them. Um, I thought there was a raciness and, and this wonderful kind of charged malic acidity in, the, in the, the, the stainless steel, which I just absolutely loved. There was a sense of, of excitement and, and, uh, and just, just, you know, amazing potential for long-term aging in that wine. And uh, then the wines that were in barrel still had that wonderful electric riveting acidity, but, but more creaminess, which was coming from them. Barrels were a little bit younger back then as well. So those wines were very, when I put that blend together, that was a risk because I didn't quite know how long the, the, um, the, the, that wine would take to, to, to reach a sense of maturity so we could release it. So there was a lot of tension and nervosity in that wine. Really, really liked it. But once I bottled it, and tasted it two, three years later, I thought, wow, there's still a lot of tension and nervosity in this wine, it's gonna take some time. And compared to the 2010 vintage, even though it was a year younger, younger the 2010 wines were instantly charming, absolutely delicious, charming, easy wines. Again, without any malolactic fermentation, but they were just much more forward and immediate wines, and they just presented themselves a little bit like the 2011 vintage, which was so warm. They presented themselves ready for service very, very early on. Um, so we, we sold through those wines, and then we had a look at the 2009 again, and it was still very, very much kind of locked down. It had gone into a, a, a phase of its life, even though it was, you know, three, four years on, on lease at the time, um, where it was just not showing the type of quality that it had shown, you know, as a base wine before it was bottled. Um, so again, we had to think, right, let's taste the 2013 vintage, a whole four years younger. And that was very, very much like the 2010, but in a much more broad and structured fashion um, because it was, uh, it was Pinot, Pinot dominant. So we decided to release the 13 before the 2009. Um, round about 2016, I looked at that wine again once it was six, nearly seven years on lees and just an amazing transformation had happened. So that's when we released the 2009, once it had been in the cellar for, for a good seven years. And wow, how that wine had changed because it had gone through that kind of dumb, closed period and it just, it flowered, it started to flourish. Um, and it still, it remains one of my favorite wines, absolutely favorite wines. And the good news is that we've kept a little bit of that wine back, but more importantly, I also made a, a, a decent quantity of 2009 vintage magnums back then. And uh, those uh, are now nearly 10 years on Lees and they are going to be unbelievably exciting. <laughs> so will we be producing a late disgorge 2015? So I think this, we're talking about how we deal with yeah. our different disgorgings. 
Okay, okay. Um, the idea very much is with these vintage wines, um, they're only made in small quantities. You know, typically it's like 6,000 bottles, 8,000 bottles. It's big if we're making something like 10,000 bottles of one of these wines. And because the evolution of them is so interesting, you know, we'll sell them over a period of years, but then we like to keep back a, a quantity of them, maybe 500 bottles, maybe 1,000 bottles. Um, of the, the vintage wines and give them some extended time in the, in the cellar, you know, eight years, 10 years, something like this. And this, this really, it's, it's fascinating because they're very, very um, pleasurable, almost hedonistic wines to, to, to drink, but it's giving us an indication. It's showing us what the vineyard is actually capable of doing. And I think this is really, really important because we all know the English wine industry is a very young industry. We haven't been around for, for, for very, very long. So there's still a great deal we, we have to learn and we want to learn. And, you know, once you have a, a very good site like we have here at Wiston Estate, you want to experiment and see what it's capable of. So yeah, like to keep back some of those um, longer time on Lee's wines, just small portions of them and, and see how they show. What's been your best stroke favorite year to date vintage that we've released so far or or even that's still sitting in barrel well yeah 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 I'm, i must admit <laughs> i must admit the uh the the 2010 vintage the one i was describing which was so um you know effortlessly accessible and approachable so so young in its life this is an amazing vintage because it was a uh, big vintage in terms of the, the quantity of grapes that we had. Plus there was the, the sanitary condition of the grapes, how clean they were in terms of disease was amazing. Absolutely amazing. There was, there was you know, up, no disease there. There was nothing threatening the health of the vines. So they produced this abundance of really healthy grapes. And then not only were those wines extremely accessible when they were young. I think we uh, disgorged the first of that 2010 when it was only you know, two and a half years on lees and uh, and was able to have a very very low extra brut dosage it was released at four grams per liter so those wines kind of broke a lot of rules really but the most amazing thing about them and i think this is probably linked to just how clean that fruit was at harvest um, was the wines have then showed an extraordinary ability to age for a long time. Now, normally you don't have that with, with, uh, with wines that show very well when they're young. You tend to expect them to, to actually maybe start to fall away after a few years. But uh, those 2010s built in intensity as, as, as time went on. So for a, for a long time, I've been thinking that, uh, you know, if I could choose one uh, vintage to repeat year on year, um, it would be the, the 2010 vintage. And what about 2018? Well, 2018, the much talked about vintage, um, extraordinary vintage, um, absolutely huge, massive, by far and away the biggest vintage I've ever been involved in. And I think probably anybody who's involved in, in the English wine, um, because the, the quantity of, of, of grapes that, are, that that fantastic flowering and fruit set in the middle of the, the summer of 2008 uh, produced was just amazing. You know, not only had we a huge amount of, of, um, of, 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 of bunches of grapes on each vine, but the population of berries on every single bunch was absolutely massive as well. And uh, that summer just seemed to go on for, for well, years because it was just warm right throughout. And then we had a, a fantastic Indian summer that led all the way into, into October. Um, so those wines are, are again, I think they'll be like the 2010 vintage because they appear, and we've been tasting some of them, they're only bottled in uh, July of last year, but um, they appear to be wines that will show themselves really, really well, absolutely well when they're young and then I wouldn't be surprised if they go on to age for a long time. We will be able to see that because there's so much of that 2018. It really, really did fill our cellars, you know. We're talking about each vineyard producing generally three times, in some cases almost four times their average yield. So it was um, really spectacular. When will we release our next Blanc de Noir? Ah, good question. Good question. So. Um, the two wines that I, I make most infrequently are the uh, Vintage Rosé, 
um, because I'm, I'm looking for only the very, very best uh, conditions to make that wine, vintage rosé. And when I do make it, I tend to not make Blanc à Blanc and not make the cuvee um, because I want all of that fruit to go into the, the rosé. Um, but then Blanc et Noir, I only make that, well, I've been making it on average of every four years. 2010 was the first, um, uh, which is a spectacular wine, absolutely amazing, using the Dijon Pinot Noir clones from the 2010 vintage. But then the next wine, uh, Blanc et Noir, is from the 2014 vintage. It's a little bit different in style. Um, it's not 100% Pinot Noir. It's around about two-thirds um, Pinot Noir and one-third Pinot Meunier. Uh, again, or aged entirely in barrel, 100% in old oak barrels. And uh, that's been in the cellar now, so bottled in 15, so it's been in the cellar for five years now. And uh, it's a very, very interesting wine indeed. It's got this wonderful soft texture, um, but it's got an energy to it as well, um, which is really, really exciting. And well, we're going to experiment, do a few experimental things with that wine because I think it's a wine which, you know, you taste it when we do some trial disgorgings and you taste it without any dosage and the wine just really, really has got enough, you know, depth and completeness to, to maybe be a Zodo, maybe be a zero dosage wine. We'll have to have to see about that. How do we preserve our reserve wine? How do we preserve the reserve wine? Well, I touched on that earlier on, you know, it's in stainless steel, so it's, it's very, very um, protected from, from the elements, from oxidation. And uh, keeping it on, on yeast lees is very, very important, very, very important. And I guess the, the other way is we're always replacing a portion of it with much younger wine every year. Why do we make a non-vintage wine when lots of different English sparkling wine producers don't? Okay, um, well, I suppose the, the main reason is that we've got very limited vineyards. So the quantity of wine that we can make ourselves from our, our, our own vineyards is, is really quite small. Um, the other thing that I want to do with the fruit that's coming from, from the Whiston Estate vineyard at Finden Park is I want to be able to take the very, very best of that fruit to make our vintage wines. Um, now, some fruit is less good than other fruit, so we actually you know, downgrade that if you like. And uh, then we're able to buy in some fruit from other, other producers, other vineyards, and that's how we make the, 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 the Brut Non Vintage. So it's really to satisfy um, uh, different price points, because the vintage wine is, is more expensive, we're using the better fruit. And uh, it's scalability. We'll only ever be able to make more vintage wine should we uh, plant more vineyards, whereas the Brut Non Vintage is a more scalable wine, we can always acquire fruit from other places in order to be able to boost the, the, the volume of that wine. And then finally, it's our final question. Final question, um, okay. When are we doing another? <laughs> when are we doing another? <laughs> another another? Okay, well, we <laughs> shall see. Watch this space, I guess. Watch this space. Um, uh, let's maybe, uh, we shall see. If we, if you subscribe to our mailing list, that's then... that's probably the answer I should have given. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the Whistler Estate website, um, subscribe, give us your email, and uh, we will inform you when we're going to do the next uh, spotlight tasting. As I mentioned earlier on, it'll um, be, be either the rosé, non-vintage and vintage, or the blanc de blanc, vintage and non-vintage. Um, so um, yeah, stay in touch, stay safe, be well. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you.